Welcome to a Sirius XM radio presentation. Tonight, Ron Bennington interviews musician and activist Tom Morello. And now, from the Sirius XM studios in New York City, your host, Ron Bennington. Good evening. Tonight, we're here to talk with a Grammy Award winning artist and activist. As the guitarist for Rage Against the Machine, Tom Morello fused aggressive hard rock with militant politics. He later formed Audio Slave with Chris Cornell and co founded the political website Axis of Justice. Tonight, he's here to talk about his second solo album, The Fabled City. Stay tuned as Ron Bennington interviews Tom Morello. Take 
that is whatever it takes uh, from the new CD, The Fabled City, The Night Watchman. Tom Morello in studio. How are you, sir? I'm well. How are you? Great track. Thank you very much. Great track. It's uh, interesting to see you plugged in for this one, huh? Uh, well, actually, <laughs> on that song, it's still a nylon string acoustic classical guitar, but it's plugged in through some of my electric guitar effects pedal. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, is this something you figured out in the studio or something? Yeah, definitely. Know? I made this record with Brendan O'Brien as well, who's produced you know some of the Rage and Audio Slave records. Is mm -hmm. you know well has done great work with Springsteen and Pearl Jam and the new ACDC record. And we just sat down with this batch of material and uh, and decided that some of the songs need to be more lent themselves to be fleshed out more. And so that was one of the things we tried on so this track. So you give yourself a little time in studio? Is that how it works? You know what? We work really fast. I mean, that's one of the reasons I like like I I like writing fast and recording fast. And Brendan has the same. Uh, there's not a lot. We don't spend like three days trying to get a kick drum sound, you know. <laughs> and then you don't go back and listen to it and go, "I wish I would have done something." Oh yeah, some, and there's certainly there's certainly a process after. I think with the initial recording we did in about eight days for the for the record. Then you, know, you get to take it home and listen to it, and then if there's some fiddling about that needs to be done. But wow, eight like, days. Yeah, like capturing the spontaneity of a you know the performance and um, not lingering about. Eight days is like uh, Sun Records. It's like that's yeah. the way. Yeah, that's how, that's how we that's how we make those records. It's yeah. very fun. Uh, is the writing differently when you're not with a group? I mean, this is your oh dr dramatically different. I mean, for, for one, I'm the sole lyricist of, mm -hmm. of of this, and you know, in in, in Audio Slave, Chris Cornell wrote the lyrics, and in Rage, Sack wrote the lyrics. So there's that that component, which is completely different from those wor worlds. Uh, and and also the, in in writing the Night Watchman songs, the the music tends to follow the lyrics uh, often. In my rock bands, it's the other way around, where the music will come first, and then melody and lyrics will follow. So normally, you would just say, "Look, I got this hook." I don't. Yeah, know I got what... a bunch of, I got a couple of riffs. Then you know, it's it's a band's chemistry which makes it what it is. So mm -hmm. you know, Timmy and Brad and you know Zach or Chris, whatever, would chip in with their musical ideas as well. And it normally would be a pretty fleshed out musical piece before there was any, um, certainly before any lyrics were penned for it. When doing the night watch stuff, almost always there's a. Uh, you know, a sheet of paper or two with with lyrical ideas on it before I even pick up the guitar. So, d is it because you want the the lyrics to come from the the lead singer? The lead singer has to connect with that. Or? I, th I think definitely. I mean, in some bands, it, work, it works differently. And I did contribute some lyrics to Rage Against the Machine, but Zach wrote ninety eight percent of the lyrics for that yeah. band. Um, and I think that in order for for uh, you know something to ring true, in order for a band or an artist to be as good as they can be, it has to be very honest. And right. so, you know, that's why we didn't, you know, try to, you know, that's why, you know, in Audio Slave, Chris Cornell was not going to step into Zach's shoes. You sure. know, and, and, and that was actually one of the, uh, one of the major, uh, part of the major impetus for me to undertake doing the solo stuff was that I very much enjoyed being an Audio Slave, but it didn't really reflect my world view in a way that Rage had. So right. I just started playing at coffee houses, you know, doing the writing this body of material, and well, here I am today yeah. on XM Radio. Yeah, and I assume that even for people that like a lot of bands will come in and they'll they'll just have something on a, you know, a folk guitar or whatever, and so the lead singer uh, the lead singer's got that down, but. No, lead guitarist is really writing his part of the song and the bass player and the drummer. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's got to be worked out that yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I think the principal difference between between a band setting and a solo artist setting, and with a band, when it's good, it's the band's chemistry that makes it good. Mm -hmm. Each of the, each of the members of the band submerge themselves in this kind of collective whole, and something comes out of it that none of them could have done alone. Right. And you get the chemistry. With a solo artist, you get purity, and it's completely undiluted by any other idea. Like, I like the fact that in, you know, in this, since I was 17 years old, I played in rock bands that were basically democracies where everyone pitched in. Uh, and I love with this to be able to be in sole control of every lyric, every note of music, and the way that it goes. And that's, I think, and that's why you can work a lot faster. You, eight days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does the times that things are happening, does that really, uh, you know, show what, where a song's going to come from, too? I think, I think it's, it's a process of osmosis, you know, more than sitting down. Like, when, when I first thought about writing songs, I imagined that I would sit down with a, you know, pen and paper and, at, you know, at a desk and try to think of something that rhymes with George Bush's foreign <laughs> policy sucks. You know, I could, but that's not how it worked, worked out at all. It was really a matter of just making sure that the antenna was up and, uh, you know, when ideas came that I wrote them down. And I was actually pretty surprised by the, by how, um, the material was not as stridently polyric, political as, you know, right. I, I imagined it might be. It was much more personal. It was much darker in some ways. Uh, and uh, allegorical than, than more than direct. Well, that's the amazing thing about songwriting and probably any kind of writing or, or a really strong creative nature 
is that, like you said, it's not the same as having a conversation. Yeah. These things come in how they come in, and it's just up to you if you can capture them. That's correct. It's, it is really a matter of capturing it. And, and for me, it's two different worlds. Like when I write rock guitar riffs, that's something that is so, it's low-hanging fruit. You right. know, it's, it's like, you know, I... I could sit here and probably write half an <laughs> album of rock, rock guitar wrist by the time we were done with this interview. Um, with the lyrics, it's a very different thing. It just, it just happens when it happens, and, and then you try to make it rhyme. Yeah, and, and, and put it all together. <laughs> That's huh? correct, yeah. Uh, you said you bring up the, the fact about uh, George Bush. As we're doing this interview, <coughs> we're like, what, two months left of That's correct. You know, 70-some days, That's correct. Uh, eight years. I, and I was done. I, I of course bring this up because I, I don't know anyone in, in, in rock music that's as political as you. But have you ever seen the 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 country be at a place where of such desperate feelings and at the same time it's almost naive hope? Yeah. You know, I mean, you run the gauntlet yeah, goes well, back I'm, and forth. Yeah. Well, I think I think that all those are wrapped up into one. You know, it's the one thing we have to thank George W. Bush for is being such an awful president, mm -hmm. so prideful, mean, and ignorant, and wearing it on his sleeve that it really slapped the country in the face in such a way that. That it cracked the door open for new possibilities. Now, all it is now is new possibilities. And then uh, there's this there's kind of euphoric post-election right. sense, and you know, and and for a country whose history is you know so scarred with racism, for for us to be able to elect uh, a somewhat progressive African American to the highest office in land, I think is an enormous stride towards civilization, mm -hmm. and it will be viewed that way in the eyes of the world. Uh, who I think you know, had we elected. You know, a, a McCain Palin ticket. It would have right. been like good grief. It's a clown show. Yeah. You know, like what sort of, uh, but you know, having said that, so that's you know that's the good news. But I mean, as plenty of Democratic administrations have been guilty of economic crimes at home and war crimes abroad. Sure. So I think that for those of us who, you know, who may be uh, somewhat to the left of the Democratic Party who believe in human rights and social and economic justice and peace and uh, a sane environmental policy, I'm. I, what I mean to say is the next night watching records is not going to be all love songs. Right. I'm going to be watching the night. So uh, you're going to give him his honeymoon period, but then you're going to expect some. I don't know about some, that. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I mean, I don't know about that. I mean, I think that we're, there's still, we're still involved in two uh, unjust wars overseas mm -hmm. and, and this incredible, even in this horrific economic time, there's still an incredible gulf between rich and poor, you mm -hmm. know, and the, and the, the table is slanted and we'll, you know, we'll see what happens. But uh, the fact that there is another Harvard educated half Kenyan dude from the Midwest <laughs> who was raised by his mom. A lot. It's he, that guy stole my bio. Yeah, he really is yeah. doing your act. Yeah, that's, <laughs> and he's <laughs> and, been on the cover of Rolling Stone more than I have too. Well, it's, it's weird. It, it kind of makes me feel like maybe you uh, laid this thing out for him. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> maybe there's something in the zeitgeist. Where, yeah, you know, I don't know. I don't know. We'll we'll see. I think that uh, I haven't heard from him, but I think that I I think he fears that I might be another Bill Ayers lurking in his future. Oh, somewhere. yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. If, if you would have spent five minutes, yeah, with that's him, correct. Yeah, no photo op. Yeah, don't Bi don't smile in the picture. Bill Ayers was so great that he. Wait it until the election day and then walked out and said, here's yeah, what yeah. happened. Yeah, that's correct. That's funny. That's funny. Uh, but, you know, uh, we you brought this up before because when Rage um, was really starting and, and, and coming at people, uh, it was during the Clinton administration when you guys mm -hmm. were, were getting very sure. big. And a big part of what was happening then is like the – there was about 49% of the people that were eligible showing up to vote. That's and, correct. You that's know, correct. so now I think we're up in the 60s. Yeah, yeah. And it's had more to do with George Bush That's and correct. people frustrated, much more than it will would do to this thing of hope. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, that's I mean, one of the things from a from a musician standpoint, uh, you know, bad presidents make for good music. So there's been plenty to write about over the course of the last eight years. And I think, you know, during during the Clinton administration, when Rage Against the Machine was raging against the machine, mm -hmm. you know, the question uh, I was often asked was, you know, why are you guys the only political band? And we certainly weren't the only political band. We may have been one of the only ones on the charts mm -hmm. uh and you know but during the last eight years you, i mean you can't swing a cat and not hit you know everyone from pink to you know pink to springsteen everyone's singing yeah. uh, has something to say about the, uh, the the current times well yeah i mean there was an, an enormous amount of uh political songs that came out not a lot of them got the airplay yeah and still there was still most of the acts and you could take people as big as springsteen or Eddie Vedder, they still get a certain amount of backlash yeah, yeah. from people who's like, "We're just here to rock." Right, right, you right, know? right. I mean, well, that I mean, that criticism always. I, I've been some of that criticism has been leveled at me through the years, and it's first of all, it only comes from people who disagree with your politics. Right. First of all, I mean, it's you know, and and second of all, we, there's 
when you pick up your guitar, you certainly do not put down your First Amendment rights. You sure. know, perhaps the, the critics would prefer to live in a country where musicians were unable to speak freely. But uh, that's not the one we live in. So too bad. And, you know, there was a time and probably still too that, that picking up a guitar is still a, an act of rebellion. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not music, joining it. Music, when, when music's done right, it should be dangerous. Yeah. You know, from whether it's from a symphony to the blues, it should, uh, it should press, you know, stretch the boundaries of what, what is acceptable. Well, that's what's been kind of interesting with country and Western music, that it used to be so yeah. rebellious. And now it seems like it's, you know, Ford truck commercials. Yeah, <laughs> it, is, it certainly is that. And, uh, you know, an artist like, you know, great artists like, you know, from Waylon Jennings to Johnny Cash, to, that that's, there's not much like that going on. The, Why do you the, think that is? Is it just people wanting to be popular? Well, frankly, I mean, I, I, I'm not an expert on the, in the realm of country music. Yeah. I, I just, I just, I just wouldn't know. But, uh, you know, it's, it, and it's not, it's not, I don't think it's just limited to, to country music. I think sure. at any given time, there are great artists, you know, c- compelling artists in any genre. You know, and I'm a huge fan of Shooter Jennings, who's in the kind of the outlaw country sure. game, and let, somewhat less a fan of Kenny Chesney, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think you just have to kind of sift through the, sift through the artists. So every time you go on stage, you feel like it's a it's a political act on some. I'm not account. sure that I look at it as a political act. First of all, you have to whether you're writing a song or mm-hmm. putting on a show, it's got to the 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 music the art the rock has to be compelling first of all it's not a college lecture mm-hmm. you know like like rage against the machine was not successful because it was a political band rage against the machine was successful because it was a kick ass rock and roll band that right. also had a political content that fueled its passion you know and that's what i tr- try to do with the night watchman stuff as well like i'm not up there you know reading the day's news yeah. you know it's 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 i you know, try to craft it into a song and remember the words and sing it well and, and also be the MC of the night to rock the rock the room as well. But you gotta physically grab them at some point. Absolutely. Too. I mean I think I think you have to if if it's to be you know, if it's if it people are gonna want to listen to it a second time. Now at any point now are are you more uh, are you more hopeful than you were during the early rage days or have you just you know I, I see a lot what happened of uh, with protests from time to time. Because I remember before the war here in New York 500,000 people sure. would be out on the street, didn't get a lot of play from yeah. CNN or sure. whatever, so the people kind of went uh, yeah. went away. And it um, it certainly had that Lawrence of Arabia feeling. Did you ever remember that movie? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. They, they yeah. just kind of wander off yeah, on their yeah, own, yeah. you know? Well, I mean, I, I think that in, in part, it, it, it comes from uh, uh, maybe a lapse in our understanding of how change happens mm-hmm. and maybe how it's taught and maybe how it's presented on, on the daily news. Change doesn't come from grand events like that, you know, from 500,000 people in the street. Change comes from people whose names you do not read about in history books organizing and working hard at a grassroots level every day to try to shape the world in the kind of world that they'd like to see, one that's more just. That's how that's how women got the right to vote. That's how lunch counters got desegregated. It's how the Berlin Wall fell. It's how apartheid was overturned. That's the, that's what happens. I think that there was that people were disappointed and you know when I think it was 10 million plus people around the world right. protested on a, on a particular day and it didn't stop the Bush administration from going ahead. Well, uh, okay. You don't go home and cry about that. Then you continue to organize to stop war. Uh, you know, at, you know, on the the the, the dates on this tour, uh, we have an organization called Iraq Veterans Against the War at every one of the shows, uh, and we're continuing that fight now. You know, it's and even if there aren't five hundred thousand people in the streets, it's still um, how it's going to change is people organizing on a, on a more direct local level. You know, I, I was just talking to a friend of mine about this because it was about the uh, the gay marriage thing that yeah. they, they pulled back. And gay people were just stunned mm-hmm. that this came out of, you know, nowhere. Yeah. But they were not organized with their message before this went out. That's correct. And a lot of people weren't even sure what they were voting on. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, I mean, that's, I mean that's one of the ironies of this last election was, you know, here we are, we're showing the world, you know what, perhaps America's grown up a little bit, you mm-hmm. know, and we were able to, we've had 43 presidents that look pretty much the same, and now we've got a 44th that looks, you know, we're growing, but we want to remind the world, we still hate gay people. You know, like, it's just, it's so ridiculous, you know, and I, and I, I hope that, uh, that, uh, that this really backfires on uh, on those that were trying to stop gay marriage, and that it really unleashes a kind of orga- grass level organization that can't be stopped. And so, right. gay marriage is okay everywhere. Because good grief, like, can't we just leave gay people alone to marry if they want to? It, it's interesting, but we will not <laughs> until. Uh, there is an organization to say you have to. You That's, correct. I mean? you That's have, correct. You have to fight for everything. That's, for you, you absolutely have to fight for everything. I mean, there, there were, there were, you know, 
throughout Dixie, it was illegal for interracial couples to marry. I mean, it's the mm-hmm. same kind of ignorance and prejudice that's at work here. Just like, let's let the people marry. And if you would still leave that up to, you know, a state vote. <laughs> yeah, you may. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, not too yeah, sure. Yeah, if there were a referendum. <laughs> yeah. because you have to be careful. The, the Utah. Pe- yeah, the people have spoken. They say, I don't know what yeah. they're speaking about. Yeah. All right, let's get back into the album. It's uh, the new Night Watchman. It's the fabled city. Uh, another song I wanted to talk to you, uh, well, really, we talk about the whole album, but uh, the uh, St. Isabel. How, yeah. How'd that come to you? Sure. Uh, St. Isabel is written for my dear departed Aunt Isabel. She's mm-hmm. uh, uh, lost a couple of family members this last year. One of them was my dear aunt, who's a huge part of my life. And uh, she was someone who was uh, who, who, who suffered from physical and mental disabilities throughout her entire life and never really was able to travel. So she, she actually, uh, at 82 years old, passed away in the same room she was born in, 82 wow. years earlier, in a small town in Illinois. Um, and I would, I would be her eyes and ears around the world as I would travel on tour. I'd send her postcards and call her up from, you know, different exotic places and tell her uh, what I was seeing and doing. Uh, so when she passed away, that was very sad. But so I wrote that song for her. So I'm able to play it in all those exotic places for her. So uh, so nice. this is something you had planned on or is this one of the songs that just came to you? It's one of the songs that just came to me. I mean, I kind of wrote it all at once and set it, set it to a nice sort of Irish rebel fighting song beat. I think she would have enjoyed that very much. All right, this is uh, The Night Watchman, The Fabled City, and this song is uh, St. Isabel. Isabel is coming through. 
That's St. Isabel from uh, The Night Watchman's new uh, album here, Fable City, Tom Morello uh, in studio. It does uh, sound like the Pogues are channeling through. Yeah, you know, like bit. the Clash and the Pogues are, are big influences as well. Yeah. Uh, and there, it seemed like a lot of musicians now, too, are still pretty much in touch with root music. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, what is that about? Just always going back? Well, or? I mean, for, for me, I, I discovered the genre of folk music, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. pretty late in life. Uh, you know, I grew up on metal, then it was punk and hip hop, and that's, I was all about that, you know, th through my formative years of learning how to play guitar. And it really wasn't until about, I guess maybe about 10 years ago when I first discovered the, the early Dylan records and dug back to Woody Guthrie and the Springsteen acoustic records and, and Johnny Cash and just how, just how heavy that music, you know, like that music is, it, to me is a lot heavier than you can take a hundred emo bands, tie them up in a sack and drop them off a bridge and, you know, and it's not going to, yeah. and it's going to float compared to the, the weightiness of, of some of those records. And that really appealed to me. Well, so many of those guys, you, they lived hard and you can hear it. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just them and a guitar and you're like, well, this, this guy's a badass. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Exactly. exactly. Uh, so for you, it's still a journey. Music is still a journey. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I've discovered, you know, for me, this has been the doing this night watchman stuff and now having the second, it didn't, oh, Two records in two years with a huge catalog of songs still, you know, in the bank. Um, it's, um, you know, for me, it's a it's a pretty big artistic leap forward. And, you know, and on this on this tour that I've been the Fable City tour, been doing half acoustic and half electric. So it really has all the elements of what I do. I'm able to both do, um, uh, you know, the three chords and the truth stuff of the of the mm -hmm. acoustic music and then shred my ass off with the Marshall stack and, and mm -hmm. sort of satisfy myself and uh, and. Uh, and that element of my fan base so you, as well. Yeah, you're, you're out with a full band. Cause out with a full band. The Freedom Fighter Orchestra is the backup band, and it's musicians I've played with for a while. They're just absolutely great, and they've got impeccable uniforms, and uh, it's been a really fun time. So uh, when you're out on this tour, do you know how many dates you're doing, or are you guys just yeah, this is out? Well, this is winding up right now. I'm not yeah. sure when this is coming up. But, uh, <laughs> it's right now. It's fine. <laughs> um, it goes till about mid-December, and then figuring out what I'm going to do uh, next year. But there'll definitely be more Night Watchman touring in the North America next year. And what about uh, with your other projects? With, well, with with Rage, uh, we haven't talked about what if any shows we're going to play next year. But we had such a great time, you know, this year. There's no doubt that we'll be playing. Some shows. And uh, I is, hope. is that one of those things where everybody has to sit down and talk it over? Well, I mean, be the, a reason the, for the it? glory of it is that it's it's run so much not like a rock band. Mm -hmm. We do not have a manager. We do not have an attorney. We have we have a booking agent and a tour manager. So when we yeah. decide we want to play shows, we tell a guy to book them, and then the guy organizes the transportation to get us there and it's uh it's completely devoid of all of the all of the pressures and the you know the the, the influences that at, during the first 10 years of the band's history drove us apart mm -hmm. and that's why it's been really fun to do so, uh, so that's going to happen with every band too yeah you know every yeah. band that if you don't get success something's going to happen and if you get success yeah something's yeah, going to happen yeah. bands are all you got to do is, is watch spinal tap <laughs> it's all right sign there. up on netflix get that thing it's exactly what it's like <laughs> i think the interesting thing about rage though there doesn't seem to be a nostalgic angle to him it's not like you can Correct. listen to rage and go oh yeah. yeah the 90s that's where it was yeah, at. I've, I've really found that in playing these shows like i've been to see some other artists you know who were of the Lollapalooza nation mm -hmm. and they're uh and they're uh uh you know their fan base tends to be age appropriate for that. Right. The rage shows we play, the average age seems to be it's teenagers. You know? Yeah, it, it does seem to be teenage music. Yeah, and I guess Ozzy had that sure. uh, lucky thing too, sure. uh, coming out of the seventies and the eighties. He had teens yeah. in the nineties. Yeah. you know, perhaps Rage Fest is next. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> Tell us what you're doing too with the political arm. You got a website? Sure, uh, uh, AxisOfJustice.org. A X I S of Justice.org is a, a site run by myself and Serge Tankian from System mm -hmm. of a Down, uh, and it's a nonprofit organization. And we basically started this organization to to answer the question that fans had been asking us throughout our careers, which is, how do I get involved? You know, if you live in New York or mm -hmm. Illinois or Alabama, and you're interested in environmental issues or stopping the war or uh, workers' rights issues, uh, you're two clicks away from finding local organizations near where you live. You can start becoming active today. There's also, we have a lot of music up there, podcasts. We have our own radio station in, in Los Angeles. All the podcasts are up. Exhaustive reading lists and movie suggestions and it's a nice place to and see pictures of us too. So you're not really looking to run your own kind of political arm. You're just setting them off. That's correct. Push. We actually, for a few years, for about five years, we, because people wanted to, didn't want to 
befunneled to other organizations. They wanted to join our organization. So we we had a couple of branches, but during our busy rock lives, it's hard to oversee the whole thing. So we've kind of scaled it back to the website and radio show. And, for example, when I go out on tour, the Access of Justice is represented. A portion of the proceeds go to our philanthropic wing, which then helps homeless shelters and yeah. food banks in the different cities. Well, one of the funny things about, you know, the left has taken heat for this, of not being organized enough where you'll go to an anti-war thing and then yeah. there'll be PETA people with Oh, my gosh. I, amen. Amen. I'm things. with you there. I'm with you there. It's like, yeah. it's embarrassing. It's like, how do we, <laughs> like, no wonder. Yeah. And then and of the people that are there, they're all arguing with each other right. about, you know, like, there, there's, you, you know, we're, we're trying to, you know, end the war in Iraq and there's these guys arguing, you know, Mao versus Trotsky. You know, like, I'm like, Come on, people. Let's get it together. And then the Republicans, for some reason, they move like a school of fish. They all <laughs> yes. turn back and yes, forth at the yes. same time. That's, uh, that's, I'm, I'm not sure that that's complimentary, but it is. It, 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 can, <laughs> yeah. it can be effective. And that's why I think that, that, that things like music, that culture can be a very, very important component mm-hmm. of any struggle for social justice. In that, on the one hand, it makes... It brings people together. It creates this kind of vibe of solidarity, and you don't feel alone in your right. opinions. You know what I mean? Like, for me, it was bands like The Clash and Public Enemy. Like, I was stuck in this super conser- arch-conservative suburb of, of Chicago and where, where Democrat Democrats didn't even run for office where, mm-hmm. I, where I grew up. Um, and then I discovered these bands that had a similar worldview to me, and it made me think, you know what, there's more to life than what I see, you know, in my high school in this community. Right. And so I think it really can branch out like that. But I noticed that at raid shows and at night watchman shows that there's a, uh, seems a greater sense of possibility, uh, coming out of the, the, the venue than going in. So, uh, again, there has to be a certain amount of spirit. It's just not the intellectual fight. People have to have a certain amount of, of attachment. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that there was a there's a Joe Hill is my favorite guitar player of all time. Interestingly, he has no recorded work, mm-hmm. uh, but he was the the poet laureate of the uh, of the working class in the in the early 20th century here in the U.S. and 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 he said that uh, you know a pamphlet or a book is read one time, but a song is sung over and over and over again. And he used his music to unite. Uh, uh, workers of different backgrounds who often didn't speak the same language but could unite around a melody and mm-hmm. around a message that they might not otherwise be able to find common ground. And I think that music definitely has that pur- can serve that purpose. And look how the change takes place. I mean, uh, you know, you do uh, some Morty Guthrie in your in your shows, but yeah. and we learn this land is is you know our land in school. We are in elementary yeah. school. But when he went back and and sang that. You could get your head busted for being at that show. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I mean, many heads were busted at many Woody Guthrie shows. You it's know? just amazing yeah, yeah. that people are like, oh, it's a nice, it's a children's song. Yeah, now. yeah. Well, I mean, people- it's a children's song because they edit out the verses that explain <laughs> what, it, what it's really about. But, you know, that's one of the the, the badges of honor of my career is I'm happy that uh, there have been plenty of riots and tear gassings at the shows that I've played. So I think that I, I like being another link in the Woody Guthrie chain. You should play music that makes someone want to tear gas you. You know what I mean? <laughs> if you're not, like, you, know, that, you may not be be doing God's work. <laughs> so you, you you've got to be hanging off the edge to make any kind of progress. <laughs> well, I just yeah. think that I just think that it's important to uh, to not be afraid to have your to follow your convictions in your vocation. You know, and as a guitarist and a singer, I'm trying to do that. Well, we appreciate it, Tom. Uh, let's play uh, one last song, uh, and we'll send you out here. Why don't you pick something? Off sure. How about uh, the lights are on in Spider Town? Another rollicking jam. Tom Morello, uh, it's a pleasure, my friend. Thanks, Thanks very so much, much for, for having me. In. In. Appreciate it.
This exclusive presentation was recorded at the Sirius XM Studios in New York City. Ron Bennington Interviews was recorded and produced by Earl Douglas and Franklin of Cypher Films.